Good morning and welcome to God's house. We ask the Lord's rich blessing upon you as you worship with us uh, today. Just a few announcements uh, to draw your attention to. Uh, one is that this morning we'll begin our uh, Sunday school for the season. Um, and so we uh, uh, ask, ask the congregation once the service is over to uh, either move out, outside so that uh, we will be using the sanctuary and also the nursery and the council room. So as long as we can have those uh, free. Um, also yesterday I was uh, visiting with uh, uh, Bob Santo and he sends his greetings. Also Mary does too. She was looking uh, really well. Uh, also we talked to um, Rachel Turnage in England because he wanted the address and I <clears throat> could uh, contact her through Facebook and we act I actually phoned. So we spoke to her. Um, and also as, as we were talking he was uh, he was sharing with me that he'd been reading you know a book by Billy Graham and he said oh look he said I want to just read this for you he says and uh, so in the book he's saying oh Billy Graham was talking about how people are concerned about getting old and you know all the kinds of things that they can do to uh, I guess into that process and he says um, he says a bet and he says uh, people get facelifts and stuff you know and he says um the best and the cheapest um, facelift is simply a smile. <laughs> so, so you lift your face and everyone's you know, happy for it. So uh, I thought that was funny that he's reading that and passing that on. So I thought I'd share that with you. But uh, as I said, he's doing, he's doing well and hopefully uh, we'll see him soon uh, in church as well. Uh, also, a uh, number of families are missing, of course. The Barkwins are traveling back. Uh, from a wedding in Portland. Uh, the Sowers are uh, sick, they have uh, colds, so we do want to remember all those in our congregation that are sick as well, as well as the ones that we have listed under church family. Well, let's enter into uh, God's presence with the singing of his praises as we sing from the blue Psalter uh, hymnals, number 249. <laughs> in your tabernacle, who may dwell in your holy hill. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, nor take a bribe against the innocent. People of God, let's worship the Lord with joyful hearts for our strength and health. is in the name of the Lord, and he is the one that has created the heavens and the earth. 
to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Amen. Let us worship God further in songs. We sing from the Blue Psalter hymn, hymnals number 175. Our call to holiness this morning is taken from the first epistle to Timothy, chapter 4, and verses 1 to 16. In fact, both, both the epistles... Uh, and the same way, uh, in terms of chapter 4 anyway, uh, stressing uh, God's Word and how we are to follow God's Word um, and how that that is important for us, as I say, as we begin to uh, think about the Reformation in October and focus on that this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth, 
but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And now let's come before God with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word and the reminders that it brings to our attention. That we are not to forget the very basics of our Christian faith. And none is more basic than adhering to your word. For our Father, it is through your word that we come to know you. It is through your word that we come to know your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through your word that we come to understand the gospel. And it is through your word that we receive faith. And so, our Father, we pray that we may never wander from your truth, that we would never take it for granted, that we may not think that we have no need to read it over and over again. Because as your word teaches, as we take our eyes off your word, then Satan moves in quickly to fill the void. And he exchanges the truth for a lie. And he teaches doctrines that are false and opposed to your truth, and thereby leads us astray. And so, Father, we pray that you would remind us to be faithful to your word, even as Timothy is reminded to be faithful to his calling and to preach the word in season and out of season, because it is so vital to the comfort of your people, indeed, to their redemption. And so, Father, we pray that you would indeed bless your churches up and down this land and throughout the world, that we would not have ears that are looking for new things all the time, things to impress people with, but rather, our Father, that people would hear from our lips, from our pulpits, from the testimony of your people, uh, your word. And Lord, that it would indeed uh, strengthen their hearts, that it would open their minds, enlighten uh, their minds to your truth, and that they may come to know you. Our Father in heaven, we pray then that you would forgive us for those times that we are lax uh, in regard to your word. And Lord, we pray that with all of our heart, mind, and strength, we would begin another week uh, desiring with all of our uh, strength to follow your word, to meditate on it, uh, so that we might be faithful witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we ourselves can experience uh, the blessedness of a righteous life. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you would hear our prayers, and that you would lead us into holiness For we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us stand and respond as we sing from the Blue Hymnals number 29.
gold and honey from her gold, more sweetness for they hold. With warnings they thy servant God, in keeping them is great reward. His errors who can hold, cleanse me from hidden stain. speak thy full approval win oh lord thou art a rock to me and my redeemer thou shalt be god encourages us in our pursuit of holiness by reminding us that if we confess our sin then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You may be seated. The morning offering will now be received and it will be for the general fund. And now let's come before our God with our morning prayers. Let us pray. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, it is again a true privilege and a blessing for us to come away from the world, to have their voices silenced so that we can enter your sanctuary and hear your voice hear your truth. And our Father in heaven, it is indeed um, a vexation for your people uh, to live in a world where your truth is exchanged for a lie. And our Father in heaven, we people speak lies and others agree with them. And they impose that on your people. And our Father in heaven, it is indeed just like Lot. It is a heartache for us to hear that. Your word trampled underfoot. Your law set aside and ridiculed. But our Father in heaven, we're thankful that you give us these precious moments that we can renew our strength and that we can have settled in our minds once again be reassured that this is your word 
and that our Father, it is not tied to time such that it changes over generations, but this is your inspired word. These are words that have come from you. You that knows all things from the beginning to the end. And therefore a word that never changes. And our Father in heaven we pray that we may be established in that truth. So that we may be able to stand strong in the world in which we live. And our Father in heaven no way is that more abundantly clear <clears throat> than our, in our own nation, supposedly the greatest nation in the world. And yet, our Father, we seek to promote this idea that killing children before they're born is a charitable thing, that it's a good thing, it's a kind thing. And our Father in heaven, how abhorrent those lies are in the ears of your people. And our Father in heaven, we pray that you would indeed forgive our nation, indeed forgive the nations of the world, because many follow suit and millions of babies do not see the light of day. What a black mark that is on humanity, as if it needed any more. Our Father in heaven, we also see in our country the destroying of the differences between male and female, such that anything that is said untoward is criticized and hated. And our Father in heaven, we pray that you would, again, forgive our nation with all the affluence that we have, with all the technology that we have. We use it for this, to promote sin and wickedness and the setting aside of your word. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would strengthen your church May it never be that we conform to this world. May it never be that we love this world. Because then the love of the Father is not in us. Our Father in heaven, may we always stand upon your word as you admonish Timothy to preach the word. That even though people don't like to hear it, even though they want to accumulate to themselves teachers that say the things that they want and give them freedom to live a sinful life, that from your churches, they ought to hear nothing but your word. And our Father in heaven, though we may be uh, set upon and all kinds of things said about us, may it never be that they hear anything other than your word. And we pray, our Father, that today, over the pulpits of your churches, it is your truth that we will, will be proclaimed. Because it is only by your truth that people will be led to you and to the gospel and to be saved. And our Father in heaven, that is what we desire. Not that you would destroy the world. Not that you would destroy all those that are saying these kinds of things. But rather that they might be saved. That their eyes may be opened. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless not only the pulpits today but your people, so that as they echo the truths that they hear in the week, that that light and salt would indeed spread to many. Our Father in heaven, we pray for your people. We pray, Lord, especially those that are being challenged by uh, struggles in their lives, especially uh, with health and more particularly uh, with cancer, and our Father in heaven, we continue to lift them up before you. We pray for Danielle, asking that you would continue to keep it at bay uh, while her pregnancy goes forth. And our Father in heaven, we 
pray that there would be a good outcome, uh, both in terms of the pregnancy and also with the, uh, with the tumor that she has. And Lord, we pray for Sharon as well, that you would keep the uh, cancer at bay as well, and that she may continue to enjoy life. And uh, Father, then we pray for as well for Joan. Uh, as she continues her treatments, we pray that they would be uh, not so many side effects and that she may be able to continue the treatments every three weeks. And Lord, we pray for also Ruth Dieleman um, and pray that you would indeed bless her treatments and, as well, that they may indeed be effective in, in uh, keeping the cancer or stopping its growth. Our Father in heaven, we pray for Bob uh, Marginal as well. We pray that he would continue to regain his strength and uh, be able to be back with us uh, in a short while. And also, Lord, our seniors, we pray for Bob. We pray that he too would be comfortable in coming back to church soon. And for Mary, and we're thankful that we can visit with her and that she misses uh, the church. Uh, but we're thankful that she is doing uh, better. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would also uh, hear the prayers of your people, the struggles that we face, the burdens that we carry. Lord, we know that you are there for us and that we have this wonderful privilege to be called your children and thus be loved and cared for by you and that you encourage us and the Spirit encourages us to cry out, Abba, Father. And so we pray that we might offer up our uh, prayers to you, our concerns to you uh, in this moment of silent prayer. And we pray, our Father, that we might be assured that you care for each and every one of us and that you will hear our prayers and that you will work as you are already working for the well-being of your people. And now let's stand and worship God as we sing from Blue Hymnals number 443.
richly too, as love knows how, by kindly words and virtuous life. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. You may be seated. Our scripture this morning is taken from the book of Romans chapter 10 and reading verses 1 to 21. Romans chapter 10, reading verses 1 to 21. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear wit them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So far, the reading of God's word. Dear people of God, one of the slogans of the Reformation, as you very well know, uh, was sola scriptura. In other words, the scriptures and only the scriptures are to be the sole authority of what we believe and how we behave. And this is what had got obscured in the 16th century. And this is what Luther thought. That's, that's the way he was. That's the way uh, the environment that he lived in. 
And as he came to study the scriptures, he realized that that didn't win the day. To quote the scriptures didn't win the day. But rather the church had its own authority. It looked to its own councils. It looked to its own theologians. It looked to the Pope. And more often than not, what they said went, even though it was contrary to the Scriptures. And this morning, I mean, we've looked in recent uh, weeks, not that long ago, when we looked at um, the Word of God uh, in Peter. And so this morning I thought, well, we'd look at it in a more narrow way, and that is in terms of the gospel and salvation. And so, as you know, Luther was uh, very strong on standing on the Word of God, and um, even though he had a lot of opposition, and the church said, well, are you the only one right? And look at all the uh, things that uh, other people have said. His being backed into a corner, he said, unless he could be shown from Scripture that what he was saying was in error, that he would not recant anything. That he was going to stand on the Scriptures. And that's the uh, quote that we have uh, no doubt heard, where he says, here I stand. That's what he meant. Here I stand. I'm standing on the Scriptures, and that's the authority that I'm going to bow to. And if any, anyone says anything that is contrary to that, then he's going to believe the Bible and stand on that rather than listen to those that oppose it, no matter who they are. And as I said, this, this passage really focuses that, that whole truth uh, on the gospel. As it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're saved by faith, but where does that faith come from? Well, it comes from what? It comes through the Scriptures. I mean, that's not the only thing, of course, because our catechism asks that very important question, what is true faith? And certainly it recognizes the role of Scripture. But not only that. So not only do we believe everything that God's Word reveals as the truth, but more than that, the work of the Holy Spirit who creates in us that trust in God. And so the Word of God is an integral part of us coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we ignore or modify the Bible, in fact, what we're doing is obscuring the gospel. And hence the way of salvation. And so that's why it was such an important issue in the Reformation, that the Scriptures be understood and asserted once again and recognized once again that they are the Word of God and only they are the Word of God. And when preachers reduce the preaching to telling stories or entertaining or giving pep talk or talk about morals or politics or whatever other pet subject they might have, they are failing. They are failing their calling. And they hinder the people from hearing the good news of the gospel. Now let us be reminded as we enter this season of reformation. This key truth that the Bible is the word of God. And is a key ingredient to faith and indeed to salvation itself. So first of all, the scripture is an integral part of of faith. And that is clearly illustrated by Paul with reference to the Jews. Paul, he says, has a heavy heart for the salvation of his people, the Jews. And his concern shows that though they were the people of God, the covenant people of God, yet Paul does not automatically think that they are believers. In fact, he knows that they're not. He acknowledged that they were not saved, but they needed to be saved. And what exactly was the problem? Well, Paul states it, that it's not one of lack of zeal. 
It's not that they weren't spiritual people. It's not that they weren't interested in spiritual things. There are many people like that. Paul encountered them on Mars Hill. That's all they spoke about every day. I mean, you'd think they'd get tired of it after a while. But no, every day they would come. And they'd go on and on and on and on and on without end. Speaking about spiritual things. At times, as I said, people are persuaded by zeal, by interest, by religious activity. And they may mistake it for genuine faith. Well, Paul doesn't. Paul doesn't. In fact, he acknowledges that they were not saved and that it was due to what? It was due to ignorance. That is, that's what it was. An ignorance, a lack of knowledge. They didn't understand the gospel. They didn't understand God's word. And what God had revealed very clearly, even back with Moses, they still did not understand. And so they made things up. Saw it as they saw it. Thought they were, they were the people of God simply by being ethnically Jews. Well, what do we have to be saved from, they said to Jesus. We're the children of Abraham. I mean, doesn't that clinch it for you? I mean, why would you ask us that question? We're the children of Abraham. And when Jesus spoke uh, to Nicodemus, he couldn't, he couldn't fathom what Jesus was talking about. Born again? <laughs> I mean, I'm a teacher in Israel. You're telling me that I have to be saved and born again? I mean, I mean how does that even make sense? Can a man be born again? Enter into his mother's womb and be born again? I mean, what ignorance that is. I mean, even the unbelieving world around us understands what we mean when we say you have to be born again. They don't think you have to be, have a second birth again. But that's what he thought. Had no clue. And the Lord Jesus Christ is astonished. You are a leader, a teacher in Israel. And you have no idea what I'm saying? I mean, talk about ignorance. The Jews were religious indeed. But in their ignorance, they ended up doing what? Crucifying the Lord of glory. I mean, how blind do you have to be that you cannot recognize the Son of God? Not only in terms of the way that he was born and the stories that were, were out there, but in all that he said, in all that he did, the miracles that he did, all of that they couldn't come to the conclusion that this was the Son of God. In fact, they came to such an opposite conclusion. He's of the devil. I mean, how wrong can you get? He, God, comes incarnate and you call him the devil? That he's in cahoots with the devil. Luther no doubt would have said the same things about the Catholics of his day. They were very busy with activity. But they were ignorant. In terms of the way of salvation. When we think of all the ceremonies and elaborate worship but a distinct lack of preaching and teaching, then we can see how people were ignorant of the Bible and hence hindered from coming to genuine faith. You know, when the, the church made the argument to the reformers, the look, we have to have all of these images because people are, you know, simple and they don't understand. And so these are uh, used to kind of illustrations to use them. You know what the reformers' response was? Well, maybe if you preached to them, they wouldn't be so ignorant. Maybe if you taught them, they wouldn't be ignorant. And you wouldn't need all of these things that you are using. And today, too, we can have churches that are very busy, very active, many programs and causes that they um, pursue, but they do not focus on teaching the Bible. 
Thus people are busy but remain ignorant in regard to the way of salvation. So ignorance leads to false gospels. That's what it does. Paul goes on to show that ignorance about the Bible left the people susceptible to false gospels. As they ignored the Bible's teaching, they ended up seeking to establish their own righteousness. So they had to stand before God in an acceptable way. They refused to listen to what the scriptures taught, so they made their own up. And so they relied on their own righteousness. In other words, they tried to earn salvation by their good behavior, known as works righteousness. I mean, the devil has won. Once he gets us on that path, I assure you the devil has won. Because you'll never do it. Luther found that out. The Apostle Paul found that out. Everyone, the, the Jewish nation found that out. Every time you try and establish your own righteousness before God, it's an absolute and miserable failure. They thought by keeping the law of God, they would be saved. However, they could not be more wrong. No one can keep the law. The rich young ruler was made aware of that. Who thought he had? Paul thought he had kept the law. He thought he was perfect. I mean, after all your sin, you do a sacrifice taken away. Big deal. Done it. But what, what change is happening in us? And isn't that, isn't that the way the Catholics operated? I mean, they're not the only ones, by the way. Others can fall into that trap too. Okay, you sin, well, you go to the, uh, you go to the priest and you confess your sins and he absolves them and all, all is fine and hunky-dory. So as long as I'm faithful in going to church and doing those things, that's it? We're really trying to establish our own righteousness. Paul wasn't saying that he was perfect, that he never sinned. All he was saying, he was dealing with it in the way that God had prescribed in the Scriptures. Relying on the Old Testament, relying on sacrifices. Never coming to where those sacrifices were pointing, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. No, he was a good Pharisee. And he thought he had succeeded in his own eyes. But when he heard the word of God, he realized that he had nothing. Absolutely nothing. And Luther, with all of his efforts to try and live a righteous life, he never did. He never did. At least he was truthful about it. Paul thought he had. Luther never did. He always fell short and it was a miserable pursuit. So frustrating to him. Until he came to this truth. That the righteousness of God was not a demand of God that he expected us to come to and present to him. But rather the righteousness of God was a gift of God. It was a gift that God gives us. It's a righteousness that he imputes to us. Abraham believed and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Abraham didn't establish his own righteousness. How, how were these people saying they're the children of Abraham and had no idea what Abraham did in terms of how he came to faith? He wasn't keeping the law. The law wasn't even given then. It wasn't by circumcision. The circumcision came after that, that verse, when it says Abraham believed and God accounted it unto him as righteousness. How did Abraham come to believe? By faith. Not by righteousness that he had established of his own. People of God, we need to continue to promote that teaching of the scriptures. Because as I say, it's not only to the Catholics that you can point fingers. 
in the Protestant churches, they are those that pursue basically the same truth, which is that you have to live righteous lives. And when you live righteous lives, that's, that's the, the foundation of your standing before God. And nothing can be more miserable. Nothing is more such a, uh, such a drastic failure as that. We're just fooling ourselves. So what does the scripture say? The scripture has always spoken of salvation as something that we believe and confess, not something that we do or earn by good deeds. And so Paul takes them back to Moses, their big hero of the Old Testament. He says, you like Moses? Well, let me quote Moses. Well, not quote Moses, obviously, quote God's word that came through Moses. What did Moses say? He stated that if you want to do it by the law, then here's the requirement. The man who does these things, that is, keep the law, will live by them. And you may say, well, why would Moses say that? I mean, obviously no one's going to be able to do that. Why is he sending them on a wild goose chase? Because Moses wants them to understand that. Don't go down this path. I mean, we might, might say the same thing about the Lord Jesus Christ. The rich young ruler came to him and said, well, what do I have to do to uh, um, uh, earn eternal life? Well, Jesus didn't say, are you kidding me? What are you talking about? There's no way that you can do that. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, well, keep the law. Keep the law. Was Jesus trying to tell him that that's a viable method? Clearly not. Clearly not. Because when the guy says, well, I kept all of those things from my youth. I mean, talk about another Paul, right? He was eager. He was a good person. He was a good, had a great childhood. I mean, we would have uh, looked at him as a model uh, covenant child. I mean, look at this child. Well, so was a part of the elder brother, by the way. I mean, he lived a decent life. He obeyed his father. He did all the work. He wasn't frittering away uh, his father's money. No, he looked good from the outside. But when Jesus told him, well, one thing you lack, don't sell everything that you have and follow me, suddenly his true motive was brought out into the open. Because here it was, life or your money. I mean, you claim that you really love God and you're keeping his law and everything like that. Well, here it is, eternal life or your money. And he couldn't. He chose money. Because that's what he really loved. That's what he really trusted in. And he walked away sad. I mean, he didn't say, Lord, help me. I, I, you know, I can't seem to do that. Help me. No, he walked away sad. What a, what a terrible thing that is. You walk away and you're sad. You don't have any peace, but you walk away. Where are you going? What is your end going to be? You have no solution. It's amazing to me that people ridicule the gospel. They have nothing. They live a miserable and an aimless life and they criticize those that have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you kidding me? You want me to have your life and you have nothing? Why in the world would I ever do that? And why in the world would you do that? Your own words tell you you're not content. Your own words tell you that life is miserable. But that's how sin is. People that are under the influence. They know it's bad. Taking drugs, drinking, being drunk all the time. They know it's bad, but they continue doing it. They don't have the power to get out of it. And that's what sin is. And so Moses says to them, you want this path, um, method? You want to go down this path? Well, let me tell you what it entails. You keep the whole law and then you'll live. But no one's going to keep the law. 
And so Moses wasn't giving them another viable way of salvation. He was telling them not to go down that path. That it never worked. It hasn't worked from Genesis chapter two, chapter 3 on. It didn't work with Adam and Eve, and it never has worked with anyone. No one has ever succeeded in that path except one, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says, but Moses speaks of another way. A way of faith. The true way of salvation taught in the scriptures. Does not lay upon you the burden of securing your own salvation. In other words, who's going to go up and bring Christ down? Who's going to come uh, go down and bring Christ up? You know, establish that which God did through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible does not give you steps to follow and achieve in order to be saved. What it says, says the Apostle Paul, is that we're to have faith in God and in his word. We're to confess, without, with, believe and trust, that is, in the Lord Jesus Christ. That God raised him from the dead. You didn't have to do it. God raised him. You didn't bring Christ down. God sent him down. His death was a sacrifice for our sins. And his life was our righteousness and is. Our perfect life is not one that we must live in our own strength. But rather it is a life of Christ that is transferred to our account. So we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive righteousness just like our father Abraham. What the Bible calls you to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross as a payment for our sins and his life as our righteousness. Whoever, whoever, it doesn't matter who you are, whether a Jew or you're a Gentile, it's the same path for all. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, but will be saved. Are you still working on your salvation? It may be in a reformed kind of garb, but it is just as dangerous as the Jews or the Catholics or any other false religion. No, it is out of ignorance, and we need to put that away. The Bible says abandon such hopeless ways and simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Scripture is also an integral part of ministry. It's needed by everyone. There is no other way of salvation. There is no distinction between nations. It does not matter if you're a Jew or within the churches, Protestant or Catholic, or even if you're a Gentile, someone not connected with Christianity. All need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one way of salvation for all men. All must understand the Bible and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if this is the case, they must understand, we must understand, how crucial the ministry of the church is. The world needs us. The world will not come to faith apart from the ministry of the church. We need preachers who will stick to their main tasks. They, they cannot focus on being counselors and youth activity leaders or entertainers or motivators. Their vital task is to preach the gospel. This is why Paul is so proud of the gospel. Preachers are sorely needed by the world because through their faithful ministry, people will hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Faithful preachers are like doctors that hold the cure in their hands. That's sad to say, in the New Testament times, as well as at the Reformation, preachers were driven by money or fame. Not much has changed. Preachers are precious and to be respected when they preach the gospel of peace and thus bring glad, good, and biblical truth. Why? Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When preachers preach the Bible, then they are a blessing to all who hear. But when they neglect, and worse still, modify the Bible, they are a curse, for they prevent people from hearing the gospel and thus being saved. 
Simply having faithful ministers is not going to guarantee conversions, of course. We read that not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah in the Old Testament laments before the Lord. In Isaiah 53 of all places, Lord, who has heard our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He's talking about his own people. His own covenant people wouldn't hear what he was saying. It is not that Isaiah did not preach the message, but they did not believe. How sad. When we have faithful preachers, but we take no notice. It'll be worse for us than for nations of the world where there aren't as many preachers and churches. Because we've heard it over and over again and we turn our backs. The Jews were sent prophets over hundreds of years, but they would not listen and killed most of them, as Jesus said. Which of the prophets did your fathers not kill? Many Jews died in unbelief. How sad that they had the privileges of hearing God's word through faithful prophets like Isaiah, but they refused to believe, but continued to follow their own way of salvation, namely, by good works. However, God did not abandon them, but rather sought to provoke them to jealousy by sending the gospel to other nations, like the Gentiles. You know, when children act up by not appreciating what we're doing for them, then sometimes... We offer it to somebody else and all of a sudden the interest of ours is in them and they want it now. If it's going to go to someone else, oh no, we can't stand that. And so they go after it and in a sense that's the methodology that God used. The gospel went to the Gentiles. And you know how mad the Jews got with the Apostle Paul. But it was a an effort to impress upon them, not, I mean, not just a ploy. Of course, God is interested in, in the Gentiles. But also, though, it did have this benefit of pricking the minds of Jews, that if they were going to act like that, then even as the Apostle Paul says, well, then I'm going to the Gentiles. And they were so irate when he said that. God was so patient with them. That they had no excuse. He said to the others, they find me here and there. But to you, I held out my hands all day long. And you refused. How much worse is it going to be for them? As I said, it is personal to us. How is it with us? Have we heard the gospel? It's all too easy for our children To hear the gospel over and over again, week by week, and just until it becomes not that important. Well, we've heard it before, we've heard it before. No, it's important that you hear it and you believe it with all of your heart. How sad it is that God so graciously allows you to hear the gospel, to be raised in Christian homes. The gospel to be so close that you can almost taste it. And yet we don't. As Jesus said to some of the Jewish leaders, he said, "The, the prostitutes and sinners are getting in before you because you stand outside the door and you never go in. You act as though you don't need to go in. And they are being saved before you. The people of God, the scriptures have to be. The scriptures have to be foremost in our minds and hearts in terms of the ministry that we have in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that to be in the church is no guarantee of salvation. The Jews made that mistake. So do the Catholics and so do many churchgoers these days. We have to believe with all of our heart and confess with our mouth The truths of the scriptures that Jesus is our Savior. And we have life in him. That's what you need to ask yourselves. Do I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do I truly believe that he's the son of God? That he came down for my sins? That he paid for them on the cross? But all the other nations of the world need to hear the same gospel. The only way of salvation 
for everyone in the world is the Lord Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We cannot fall into the error of thinking Christianity is for the Western nations and all the other religions are ways that the other people and nations of the world will come to God. I mean, many give that argument. All roads lead to God. I mean, there's, I mean there cannot be more nonsense statement than that. That all religions lead to God. There is only one way, says the scriptures. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And therefore they have to be called. So we send missionaries to preach the gospel. And they receive it with such joy. And they sustain all the attacks and the abuses that they get from their nations because the others don't believe, but that yet they believe. As I mentioned uh, so many times before, they worship at a risk. We have no risk. And churches are not full. Because we take it for granted. And I'm not talking about the unbelievers. I'm talking about Christians that take it for granted. And don't come to church faithfully. Even though there's no risk to them. Let us never think that if people are sincere about whatever religion they may be raised in, they will be saved. They will most certainly not. They will most certainly not. Because the Jews were serious about the religion that they were raised in. But they were ignorant of it because they stopped short of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not be saved. Paul doesn't say, oh, because they're Jews, they're saved. He said they are absolutely not. They're absolutely not. And it was a burden to his heart. And he preached to them. And he called them. And it's true of our children too. Let not our emotions get the best of us. Children need to believe also. They cannot simply think that God will not condemn our youth. After all, they are our children. He most certainly will. It didn't matter that Esau had had Isaac as his father. And so everything would be fine. No, it wasn't going to be fine. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our dear children will not be saved if they refuse to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and embrace his truth. And so we urge our children, even as Paul does about Timothy, even though he was raised in a, in a Christian home and taught the scriptures, it says he had to be made wise unto salvation. And the scriptures are able to do that. And you put a great premium on our children hearing the word of God. People of God, there are all kinds of special cases. We don't really want to go into many of them. It takes time. But let me say, there are no exceptions. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so whether our children may be physically or mentally handicapped or the unborn, there is no exception. God is able to do all of those things. That's what our confessions teach. That God is able to work salvation in ways that we don't know. But I can assure you this, it's not different to what the scriptures teach. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So the scriptures have to be paramount. And preaching the gospel has to be paramount in the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're going to have the same impact as the churches did in the Reformation. What a transformation. But to keep it going, we have to stand where they stand. Let us stand with Luther. Here I stand on the scriptures. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that the scriptures are so plentiful in our nation. That everyone can go and get a Bible. And probably free at that. That they can read it. It's in all of our libraries. And our Father in heaven, what, what access you have granted to us. What a blessing that is. But our Father in heaven, we pray that we may read and heed your word. 
We pray, our Father, that you would open the hearts of many. Turn them back to you and back to your word. Heal this nation. Let us once again admire and believe in your word. So that, our Father, we are not necessarily looked up to by the other nations of the world. But rather, our Father, that we might be in your good graces. That once again, with all of our heart and mind and strength, we would say and mean it that in God we trust. And in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, hear our prayers and bless your churches and make them useful to the nation in which we live. For we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us stand and respond as we sing from the Blue Hymnals number 468. 468. Bless the prophet's sons, Elijah's mantle, O Elisha cast. Each ate his solemn task, may claim but once, make each one nobler, stronger than the their hearts away to human needs their lips make eloquent to gird the right and every evil bring anoint them priests strong intercessors Lord anoint them with Sweet love for Christ, a kingdom one. Make them apostles, heralds of thy cross. For may they go to all realms of thy grave. In spite of thee, may they count all but lost. Stand at last with joy before thy face. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let his name be all.